I want to give just a little bit of an introduction to myself. A lot of y'all probably know me as GBPI's long t uh, longtime tax policy analyst, which is to say our kind of kamikaze uh, analyst and advocate trying to convince lawmakers and convince y'all that you don't really want those deep income tax cuts uh, that sound so good at first glance um, because, you know, at the end of the day, for a prosperous state, having sufficient revenue really is critical to be able to invest in schools, quality health services, uh, world-class infrastructure. And those investments that we need for a prosperous state with broad-based opportunity uh, really require um, you know, sufficient revenue, sufficient taxes, even though none of us really love to, to pay those things. You know, I don't love to pay them necessarily. Today, though, I'm here in a new role, um, which is to talk a bit about the other side of the state's ledger, uh, the investments Georgia is making, or in some cases, choosing not to make through our state budget. To start, let me say a few quick words about the amended budget for fiscal year 2017. For newcomers in the room, when state lawmakers get to work each January, they must finalize two different budgets. One for the upcoming fiscal year that starts next January, and one that amends uh, spending levels for the current year to address things like rising student enrollment over the course uh, of, of the year. This amended budget is sometimes referred to as the little budget. This year, the governor proposes about an additional 600 million in, this, uh, in the amended budget. That's a 2.6% uh, increase, 2.6% more than the original budget as lawmakers approved it last March. The largest two expenditures um, go to rising K-12 enrollment in public schools and to recognize higher than expected uh, revenues uh, from the transportation funding package that lawmakers, to their credit, enacted in 2015. There are also a couple of sizable investments, such as uh, $29 million to an address an uptick in the state's uh, child welfare system, and $27 million for a 20% raise uh, for state law enforcement, essentially state troopers. The pay raise for state troopers is going to bring Georgia more in line with the national average on that front and help with recruitment and retention. Now on the so-called big budget, meaning the governor's proposed budget for the 2018 fiscal year that starts uh, next July 1st. It comes in at just under $25 billion, which as you may have heard in the media, is technically a record-breaking record budget in scope, at least at first glance, which is something I'm going to return to a little bit in a moment. It's an increase of 5.3% uh, over spending levels enacted in the 2017 budget. And as you can see here, um, is Georgia's largest, largest budget in recent years and to date in absolute terms. So where does that money go? Well, as in any typical year, about two-thirds of Georgia's proposed spending, general fund spending for uh, FY 2018, goes to education and health care. Our state government is responsible uh, currently for educating about 2 million Georgians a year, whether in K-12 through schools or higher ed, and for pro providing health coverage, whether through Medicaid, Peach Care, or the state health benefit plan, also to about 2 million Georgians a year. Medicaid, uh, which as you can see along with Peach Care, makes up the biggest chunk of the budget um, after education at 12.2 percent, pays for about half of all births every year in Georgia and about three quarters of all nursing home stays in Georgia. This year, the governor's proposed budget includes an additional $515 million, that's a 5.8 percent increase, for the Department of Education. And in contrast, the budget for Medicaid actually includes an uh, $86 million decrease in state funds, due in large part to an increased matching rate from the federal government um, under our current non-block-granted version of the program. Looking at the rest of the budget, we see that transportation makes up the largest non-education, non-health care component at 8%. For the past two years, that transportation chunk has been a bit larger, a share of the pie, than it used to be um, because of the 2015 transportation law. As a whole, about 95 cents out of every dollar spent by Georgia state government goes to education, health care, transportation, public safety, human services, or debt service, the last of which being um, the annual payments on sort of longer-term capital investments. <clears throat> 
The last five cents make up all the other kind of miscellaneous things you might think of when you think about the state government, like economic development, community planning, uh, state accounting, the legislature itself, et cetera. Now the next thing that's critical to understand is that while the extra $1.3 billion in the 2018 budget, um, or the, the proposed budget, certainly sounds like a lot of new money to spend on, on various sorts of pet projects, the reality is that as in most years, the majority of those funds are eaten up by the fairly mundane kind of rising cost of state government in a growing state with increasing needs. Um, these are things like rising pension costs uh, for state employees, uh, more kids enrolling in K-12 through schools over the course of a year, um, cost of living adjustments for state employees. This year, about 80% of the $1.3 billion in additional spending goes to those naturally growing needs, the other 20% um, to smaller sort of what you might consider strategic additions to the business of the state. We describe this point in a bit more detail in the brief reports that you've been provided uh, in your packets that uh, provide our overview of the, uh, our overview analysis of the budget. But what this chart does is it shows kind of the four largest line items in the governor's budget. Um, on one hand, that can fairly be described as kind of usual annual expenses or natural growth expenses versus the four largest new initiatives. The largest natural growth investments are a 2% cost of living adjustment for public K through 12 teachers, teachers and other state employees, uh, followed by rising pension obligations and the teacher retirement system. The 2% teacher raise is really a long time coming um, since public educators have not seen a raise in several years. It'll bring starting salaries up to about $34,100 um, from uh, about $33,420. We include the, the, the teacher raise in what you might consider status quo, status quo spending because, kind of to be honest, as a general rule, these sorts of cost of living salary upticks um, would be included in most, if not all, annual budgets uh, in a state with kind of a healthier revenue stream. So, the raises for non-teacher state employees are also critical to help with recruitment and retention for essential job functi functions. Georgia in 2016 had about 15,000 fewer state employees than before the recession in 2009. That's a drop of 15% compared to an increase in population during that time of 8%. Fewer workers serving more and more people, as Leader Abrams referred to, um, is something competitive pay can help address. So in contrast to these kind of natural needs, um, you'll see that the strategic additions are more modest. The largest single item is $150 million um, in annual interest payments to service those kind of new debt finance projects around the state. Uh, things like new uh, uh, education buildings, various uh, new construction projects uh, statewide. A couple of others worth noting, the third and fourth largest, are raises for state troopers and child welfare workers. Now unlike the 2% raise for teachers and some other state employees, these larger raises are the sorts of human capital investments that only get made every once in a while um, to solve specific recruitment, retention, uh, and service issues within those fields. Now, Back to the teacher raises for a moment, because they raise really an interesting broader point. Excuse me. Budgets at their core are about choices, especially in states in Georgia that hem very closely to this fairly ultra low tax model of, of kind of how a state should be set up and run. And in his proposed 2018 budget, the governor chooses to make uh, a roughly $160 million investment in K-12 teachers for that 2% raise, which obviously, as I said, is a long time coming and is a great thing for those affected teachers. At the same time, the proposal does also choose not to fill the uh, $166 million um, austerity cut that remains in the state's quality basic education formula. Georgia has been underfunding the formula dating back to 2003 reaching shortfalls of more than a billion dollars a year during the Great Recession. As of now, that cumulative cut from all those years of cuts uh, is north of $9 billion. 
Now, to their credit, in recent years, lawmakers have made a concerted effort uh, to kind of get back to what the formula says they should spend. Um, but in truth, that $9 billion is money for uh, student supplies, teacher training, et cetera, that is not coming back, um, even if Georgia gets back to where it's fully funding the formula. In that vein of choices, one wise choice that lawmakers have had made in recent years is keeping the revenue estimate, uh, let's say, modest enough that Georgia has been able to drive surplus revenues into the state's rainy day fund, which is essentially our collective savings account. The rainy day fund reached $1.5 billion right before the recession, after which lawmakers rightly spent it down to try to minimize, to the extent possible, some of the catastrophic cuts we saw during the recession. The governor has been talking about a $2 billion goal for the past couple of years, and the 2018 budget gets us uh, a little over that mark, which is a positive. Due to um, inflation and rising state needs, this is about enough to, to uh, fund the state's business for 30 days. Uh, that's also how much that $1.5 billion right before the recession uh, was set up to fund the state, about 30 or 31 days. In closing, I'd like to run through just a few quick points related to this common idea about Georgia's annual budget being a, quote, record-breaking $25 billion. Um, we heard this last year with the record-breaking $24 billion budget and the year before with the record-breaking $23 billion budget. Um, this sort of framing around the state being flush with cash um, sometimes is, is sort of latched onto a bit by folks um, arguing about disrupting the state's underlying revenue stream and our ability to really fund the needs of the state um, through sort of uh, massive, in some cases, reckless tax cuts. Simply put, Georgia is not the same state that it was 15, 20 years ago, as Leader Abrams referred to um, earlier. Uh, back then, we had a different football coach. I think that was back in 98. Um, we had a Democratic governor gearing up for a fly to fight over the state flag. We also had about 2 million uh, fewer Georgians, fewer kids needing quality teachers, fewer people on the roads, fewer families struggling to afford health care. Georgia continues to be an attractive destination for newcomers from other states and around the globe. Georgia went from the 10th most populous state in 2000 to the 8th most populous today. Some projections are that we could be fifth largest by the middle of this century. These, are trend, these trends are unlikely to reverse, especially if lawmakers reject the misguided annual calls to turn Georgia into an unwelcoming state for families and workers who happen to arrive here as immigrants. Our rising population means increased challenges and increased funding needs. A dollar today because of inflation only buys state government um, about 72 cents worth of what it would have bought in 2000. Once accounting for those two factors, a growing state and inflation, the picture of the state budget that emerges is somewhat more nuanced. Um, the revised picture is of a state that's still running below a bit where we were before the Great Recession. If the state um, included the same amount of funds as it did um, right before the crash in per capita inflation adjusted terms, it would include about an extra $732 million in general funding and about an extra billion dollars once accounting for all of the state's revenue sources. Those numbers are important, not in some kind of crazy abstract leftist concept that knew uh, that higher tax revenues are, are somehow good for their own value or for their just intrinsically good. They're important because of the, what they mean for our ability to invest in families and communities. For example, the past, for about the past five years, our state has been consumed by the debate over whether to expand Medicaid under the Affordable Care Act. The argument that apparently carried the day in the end is that Georgia just could not afford it. It would have probably cost around 200 to 300 million dollars a year to get that done. Now, those third, roughly third of a million Georgians are still in the coverage gap and the people on the two cliff sides are facing new threats, such as the dismantling of the ACA, the block granting of Medicaid, um, and as uh, Chairman Huffstetler was referring to, the fact that um, the hospital provider fee is up for renewal this year, um, which is responsible for about $900 million in Medicaid funding. And I'm gonna wrap up relatively quickly to keep us on schedule, um, but I wanna make the point that um, there are often those who kind of hold out hope 
that uh, we're just one or two more years away from um, some sort of unprecedented surge in revenues to allow us to uh, really address some of these longstanding problems. The reality is that um, even in the good times, we have a relatively strong economy right now, relatively decent revenue growth, uh, it's still quite modest, um, you know, especially compared to recent years and still below many of those years we saw before the crash. So because of that inability of surging revenues to, to perhaps in the next few years or in general solve all our problems, um, at some point we're going to have to look at, I think, that politically unpopular reality um, that the state's underlying revenue system is likely insufficient to meet the needs of a rapidly growing state uh, with rapidly expanding challenges. What this chart shows is that in 2017, Georgia taxpayers will send an estimated 4.9% of their income to the state in the form of taxes. Uh, in long terms, they're paying an effective tax rate of 4.9%. During the 90s, um, when things were quite good for a lot of people, Georgians were paying about 6% of their income <clears throat> in state taxes. If Georgians today were paying roughly that same amount as they did during the 90s, the state budget would have about an extra $3.4 billion in it each year. To circle back for a sec, 166 million to fully fund the state's K through 12 formula. Two to 300 million dollars a year uh, to let a third of a million people go to the doctor. In closing, let me say that we at GBPI are clearly uh, forceful voices for the idea that tax and budget policy are important. There are some bore boring, wonky reasons for that, like the importance of keeping a AAA bond rating uh, so the state can get a good uh, interest rate and that kind of thing. <clears throat> but at the end of the day, it's because tax and budget policy are some of the best tools we have in the toolbox for actually making people's lives better. Um, Georgia families have seen their incomes crash the past decade. Uh, a lot of them have slipped below the poverty line. Even many families, ostensibly in the middle class, are just one piece of bad luck um, from an unexpected crash of their own. <clears throat> as you continue listening to state lawmakers debate the budget, um, and as we kind of dig into some additional issues later today, um, just kind of keep these folks in mind because that's what's at stake. Thank you. This has been a production of the Georgia Budget and Policy Institute.